the strength of the evolutionary approach is really in generating models of mental disorder. In you know, it kind of enables uh, a fresh look. Hi, Madam Hunt, and this is the Evolving Psychiatry Podcast, rethinking mental health through an evolutionary lens. Share it with the people who matter. Like it if you like it. Subscribe if you want to hear more. Okay, so Dr. Rietta Baird, qualified in 1974 in Baghdad and trained in the UK from 1979 onwards. He worked as a consultant psychiatrist for the NHS and uh, an honorary senior lecturer at the University of Sheffield for 25 years, retiring in 2012 uh, with the last seven years as medical director of a mental health trust in South Yorkshire. Riyad is currently a medical member of the mental health tribunals in England. He's had an interest in the application of evolutionary theory to the understanding of mental disorders since the mid nineties. Um, and he's published novel evolutionary theories on eating disorders, um, OCD and schizophrenia, as well as research findings, review articles, chapters on evolutionary psychiatry subjects. And he is uh, one of the chief editors of the, of the upcoming book. Riyad has um, had a, a really leading light um, role in the United Kingdom in evolutionary psychiatry. Uh, he was in instrumental in the formation of the Evolutionary Psychiatry Special Interest Group uh, within the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Uh, that was in 2016, um, in collaboration with Paul St. John Smith, who's another one of our um, interviewees in another episode. Um, he was the founding chair, actually, in 2000, from 2016 to 2020, uh, and is currently the finance officer. Um, he's also the secretary of the section of evolutionary psychiatry at the World Psychiatric Association, um, so he has a he's a really leading role in evolutionary psychiatry, and there's no one better to to introduce us to the introductory chapter. Um, so, Riyad, uh, why why should evolutionary theory matter to psychiatry? Yes, well, first of all, thanks uh, very much, Adam, for for taking the time to organise all these podcasts that will hopefully uh, advertise the volume. Um, it's. I mean, we're really excited, uh, Paul and I, uh, to um, to see the launch of the volume, um, which hopefully will will happen this summer. Uh, the introductory chapter is um, it carries the burden of introducing many newcomers. We hope uh, um, uh, in um, um, you know newcomers to evolution among psychiatrists and other mental health professionals. So, our starting point um, is that evolution is the only non-miraculous science-based explanation for the existence uh, of the rich variety of life on Earth, including, of course, uh, the origin of humans. So, while mainstream medicine and psychiatry pay lip service to this, uh, it acts as if this is of little relevance or importance to the understanding of disease and disorder. In the view of evolutionists, um, uh, this has led to an incomplete understanding uh, of the causation of mental health problems. Now, evolutionists uh, would propose that while understanding the process of natural selection um, could be reasonably straightforward, and easy, um, working out its implications and consequences for the understanding of human nature is far from straightforward and uh, requires determined uh, a determined scientific effort. So it's worth noting that the evolutionary perspective um, by its very nature is an interdisciplinary approach. It draws upon data and knowledge from a diversity of academic disciplines, including philosophy, anthropology, psychology, um, genetics, epidemiology, archaeology, and others. So evolution, therefore, helps make sense of seemingly disparate data from a wide range of fields and molds these, this uh, uh, data into a, a more into more comprehensible models. So I should um, underline that uh, evolutionary psychiatry does not seek to create a new and separate field 
um, uh, uh, or subspecialty um, to add to the myriad of, of self-contained schools of thought in psychology and psychiatry, um, evolutionary psychiatrists aim to complement and enhance mainstream psychiatry and to strengthen its scientific foundations. We also strongly support the ethical basis uh, of modern clinical practice by placing the interest of individual patients at the center of our concerns. And the introductory chapter, therefore, gives a, a, a tries to uh, give a flavor of all of these components, including, of course, uh, the basics, introducing the basics of evolutionary theory to um, mental health professionals. Yes, I found, um, I found it an excellent basic introduction for people who, you know, you heard, you hear about evolutionary theory, uh, but you maybe don't know the intricacies and, and it's, it's excellent to start off the book by kind of giving that background for people. Um, so, so the kind of role that evolutionary psychiatry plays is, is, is more scientific and explanatory um, rather than concentrating on, on, uh, on new treatments, um, etc. Uh, is that, is that fair to say? What 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 role do we think evolutionary psychiatry has in, in talking to to psychiatrists? Um, you know, how can we add to their to their practice and to to their thinking? Um, the the application of the evolutionary perspective um, can somewhere somewhere down the line can lead to new new thinking about treatment um, and about you know interventions and so forth but but that's not um, it's um, it's starting point and um, it is it is something that one can um, um, that can be an outcome of a process but the strength of the evolutionary approach is really in generating models uh, of um, uh, mental disorder, um, achieving a deeper understanding of of of, uh, uh, um, of mental disorder, um, um, in, you know, it kind of enables uh, a fresh look at uh, either mental disorder or um, uh, uh, therapeutic interventions in a new light, um, where we we can apply. Um, uh, concepts of ultimate causation or evolutionary causation um, uh, in, into uh, into these models, and and uh, we can come out with um, with a fresh look uh, at mental disorder. If those uh, those models, if if the development of those models uh, then leads us to um, thinking about new interventions, then all well and good. But um, uh, that that must be a, the uh, uh, the outcome of a process of a better understanding that evolution uh, can help us with. So it's a more a theoretical framework that um, uh, uh, that it provides us with, rather than a um, um, a sort of a a, a practical. Um, uh, a way of dealing with mental health uh, with uh, mental disorder or mental health patients mm. yeah it's not it's not a, a a simple um plan to to solve the problem it's it's a it's a perspective on on what's what might be happening and, and you mentioned ultimate um explanations there which is obviously a key part of evolutionary theory and and evolutionary psychiatry uh, we're very used to thinking of mental disorders in terms of brain states and, and, you know, especially brain chemicals, dopamine and serotonin, uh, especially. Um, but so these, these ultimate explanations that you mentioned and the sorts of things that evolutionary psychiatry thinks about and deals with, uh, what, what sort of, um, could you just run us quickly through some of the, the sorts of explanations which evolutionary psychiatry might give to various types of mental disorder um, from this ultimate perspective? Yeah, um, uh, I mean, I'll, uh, I'll give two names that uh, evolutionists are very fond of, and, and they are Nicholas Timbergen and Ernest Mayer. And these are, are two um, um, uh, landmark evolutionary thinkers uh, in the, uh, in, uh, um, of the 20th century. Um, and um, they, they have um, 
laid the foundation for for this um, uh, this new conceptualization of causation and biology based on evolutionary theory. Um, Ernest Mayer um, devised this uh, um, uh, this concept of ultimate versus proximate causation, and um, ultimate causation being, you know, causation that can be uh, uh, based on evolutionary ideas. Proximate causation is, is um, uh, the mechanisms uh, and uh, the developmental causes. Um, uh, Nicholas Timbergen, uh, who, who was the co-founder of the science of uh, ethology, um, took it a step further and um, uh, took uh, Ernest Mayer's two um, sets of causes, the ultimate and the, uh, and the proximate, and um, divided them into, um, into what is now, now known as Timbergen's four questions. Um, and there are uh, two, two of those questions are proximate um, questions, which is uh, uh, how does a system work? Uh, that's to say the mechanism, uh, how it develops during the lifetime of an organism. And the ultimate causes are again divided into two and they, they are the phylogenetic history of a system, trait uh, or organ. Um, uh, and finally the function um, uh, 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 of, uh, of this system in the organism's uh, um, natural environment. Um, and uh, it's important to um, remember that all four of these sets of causes apply all at once in the, uh, to the understanding of any given biological system um, or organ or trait. Um, so, um, it, it's, um, it, it, well, so whereas the mainstream psychiatry, mainstream medicine um, uh, look exclusively and have focused exclusively on the proximate, that's to say the mechanisms, uh, you mentioned uh, dopamine and 5-HT and so forth with regard to the brain, um, um, and also the developmental processes that that give rise to a, uh, a given trait or organ. Uh, and even uh, as evolutionists, we consider this to be an incomplete picture. We have no quarrel whatsoever uh, with, with, uh, with these as uh, valid causes that um, are, are, must be understood um, for us to, to, uh, uh, to try and uh, understand a given state or disorder. Um, but, um, uh, we think that uh, this um, this view neglects the other two causes, uh, which are uh, the function of the system, uh, that's to say, uh, uh, the evolutionary uh, um, processes that shaped that system, because that function that the system serves is what has been selected um, uh, by evolution because of its contribution to the fitness of the organisms who carried that uh, system or trait um, and the phylogenetic history uh, of the system. So, um, uh, so the, this causal system, we think, is a, is a rich framework on which to, um, uh, 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 to, to, to gain a, a, a better understanding of many of the, um, uh, uh, of the psychological traits that humans have, uh, and also the way those, those traits or systems malfunction um, and lead to suffering. Um, so um, uh, sometimes um, the uh, uh, um, evolutionary theories based on ultimate causation can actually help us identify proximate causes as well. So, so there is, a, there is an, an um, interaction between these, uh, these two sets of causes. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's not just that serotonin is affecting mood. 
Um, and that's what's causing whatever the, the brain state is. It's there's, there's this developmental history behind the individual, and that's the second question. And, you know, something in their childhood or their early life might affect how their serotonin um, system is functioning. But then also you have to understand what the serotonin system is doing in the first place. What, what was it ori its original adaptive function? Um, and that's not just a human thing. That, that can go back across the whole phylogenetic tree, and we can think about primate relatives and, and so on. So, um, yeah, exactly. It's... Yeah, giving that depth of explanation is something I find extremely appealing about um, about the evolutionary perspective. And throughout the chapter, of course, uh, sorry, with throughout the um, well, throughout the chapter, you talk about various ways in which we we think about ultimate cause. Um, but we also, uh, in the rest of the book, will think about many specific disorders and exactly um, what their what this kind of relationship might be between the ultimate and the proximate. Um, you know, placing these things in the context of evolutionary history. Um, yeah, it's it's. I think it's a fascinating subject. That's why I that's why I study it, and I'm I'm incredibly happy that this book is going to exist. It's going to be a landmark in evolutionary psychiatry. So I think you should be very proud of them. Um, you know, putting well, it together. And we certainly hope so. Um, and um, and you know, we certainly hope that it sparks some interest amongst some psychiatrists, and that these ideas can be taken forward uh, by others. Uh, uh, and develop further, make them more relevant, um, not only to the to the understanding and the constructing of models, uh, but also hopefully down the line into devising um, better interventions. Absolutely, no, I, I couldn't agree more, and I, I look forward to the to the future of the field and the book. And thank you so much, Riyadh, for for talking to me today. Thank you very much. <laughs>